have it in hardcover. Mm -hmm. That's, That's nice. Hard yeah, that would be cool, huh? Oh. Lord God, the Father just asks you to bless this time, Lord. I just pray for Ron. Yes, Lord. Lord, he's seeking. He's got to get over the flesh. Lord, maybe he's on his way. And Lord God, as we open up your word to study your word, Lord, as we move on. Lord, what may be rabbit trails, Lord, as we are working with what we're dealing with in the book of John. Lord, may you bless us. May you be with us. Lord, may we grow. Lord, for Jesus' sake, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so the Gospel of John, chapter 1. And we're going to look at verses 8 and 9. We're going to move on to what we've been dealing with. And what we're doing is we're taking the verses we're doing right now and we're, we're exploring out. And in verse 8, He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. And from this verse here, we've... We're venturing about the light and darkness where we have seen that God reveals Himself into man, all men. And we've been looking at the darkness, what it does and what it is. Mm -hmm. We've been looking at the light in the last few weeks. And we've moved from the light to the heart. Man looks on the brain. Man gets a psychiatrist. And many of the man's problems is to be dealt with is he's a sinner he doesn't need a psychiatrist. He needs the Bible. Because mm -hmm. we read last week, the heart is the source of all our sin. And what we're going to do today is, is the heart is the, what the heart does. And I'm not talking about the thing that pumps, pumps, pumps in your body. I'm talking about who you are. Right. It's not what you think. God doesn't care what you think. God's never asked your opinion on anything. It's how we feel. What we feel. He says, out of a good tree produces good fruit. Out of a bad tree produces evil fruit. It's, your heart is what your being is. Now, as far as your heart, it's the source of your salvation. Romans 6, 17. Romans 6, 17. And when you deal with people, and you witness to people, and you talk to people, I think, again, that's not the answer. Mm -hmm. Have you ever trusted Christ as your Savior? Well, I think. No, you're, you're on the wrong avenue. In Romans 6, 17, But God be thanked, which is not, that ye were the strange servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered in you. You, the application of salvation, is faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, is number one, it's not a program. Number two, it's not a television program, it's not a movie. When I was first saved, it was movie. Movies about the tribulation period. And that's not going to save you because that's not scripture. Mm -hmm. You've got to hear with your ears the Word of God. Uh, tracks have scripture in them. They are used by God. And you would think that your ears are so close to your brain, but it doesn't go into your brain. It goes into the heart. And what your heart does with the Word of God or somebody you're dealing with will accomplish either salvation or damnation. Somebody's going to be either ready to hear you. Now when we dealt with Paul on Mars Hill, there were people that mocked him. They didn't believe. The heart was dark. We saw that. We saw that there were people that said, Paul, we want to hear more. We haven't got enough. Then we heard the third people that got saved, believed, and grew. And Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Still on the heart in salvation. Romans 10, 9. And this is one chapter, verse. Start in verse 9. If you ever want to learn and know where it is, 
when you're dealing with a lost man. Romans 10, 9. That if, conditional. No, everybody's going to get saved. Absolutely not. That if is conditional. You're going to deal with somebody. Many are not going to believe. Some, few will. If, if thou, see God's not going to force you. God's giving you a free will. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. That's exactly what we're doing right now. That's our testimony. When we talk about Jesus, when we go up to somebody and say, let me tell you about Jesus, that's the mouth confessing. When I preach on the streets or I have an open Bible or a gospel tract or I'm answering someone's question, I am talking about Jesus. That is part one of a two-part of my salvation. I can't shut up about Jesus. And when you got somebody who won't even talk about Jesus, you have rights according to James. I don't know if you're saved. Did anybody who's saved? Not, not. And there's so many ways you can talk. You can just be outright bold. You know, you're going to go to hell if you don't believe in Jesus. Or you can roundabout. Deal with them. But with the mouth, with the mouth, confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. And shalt believe in thy heart, there it is, that God has raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. We're going to do verse 10 in a minute. So you've got to believe in the resurrection. Okay, children, we got this cute little story about a toy boat in Jimmy. And Jimmy buys that boat back. Where's the resurrection? You have got to talk about the gospel. Go in all the world and preach the gospel. Mark 16. The gospel, three parts. Jesus Christ suffered and died according to the scripture. He was buried. And he arose again the third day according to the scriptures. There's the resurrection. If you believe that God has raised Jesus Christ from the dead, somebody had to tell you about the gospel, the resurrection, for you to believe it. And here with the big mouth, you talk about Jesus. With your heart, you believe that God gave Jesus life after death. Thou shalt be saved. It's very important when you're dealing with somebody, the gospel. The gospel. Not the Antichrist. Not your message on whatever you got to say, unless it's about Jesus. For with the heart, man... Not your dog. I read this verse to somebody. Oh, my dogs are saved. I witnessed to them. With the heart man. No cats. No parakeets. Man. Oh, there are people out there. Yep. Oh, yeah. And they'll fight with you on that one. You tell them dogs don't go to heaven, you give them the scripture, they'll battle you. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth again confessions made unto salvation. Righteousness. We don't have no righteousness. Not of works, at least any man boasts. There is none righteous, no, not one. So what is our righteousness according to the Bible of God by us? The righteousness is Jesus Christ. I am going to heaven. I am clean in the eyes of God only by the righteousness of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. So if Jesus is my righteousness and if I believe on that righteousness, if I believe on Jesus and I open up my mouth to confess, Amen. you're saved. Now if somebody opens up their mouth and says, well, my preacher, my church, my Mary, my booklets, my magazines, my pastor, my... That's not salvation. And when you deal with the Jehovah Witness, is Jesus God? No, He's not. Then you're not saved because the Bible proclaims that Jesus is God. So, mouth, heart, 
Resurrection and righteousness equals salvation. It's not our righteousness because the Bible says we have no righteousness. And the thing is too, when we go out witness, it's not about your church. Hi, my name is Tyler. This is my wife, Tracy. We're here about the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, what church you go to? We'd like to know, first of all, if you ever received Christ as your Savior. Well, where do you go? We'll talk about that later. Because we're not there for the church. The church is not for lost people. It's for saved people. And that's why the church is so messed up today. Because they let everybody in. There's not everybody's welcome. You mean lost. And when you go out talking to people, talk about Jesus. And the biggest weapon you have in your artillery is your own personal testimony on how Christ saved you. Now, be forewarned. I have told my testimony many times to people how I was saved. And a few times people have called me a liar. Well, you weren't there. I was there. I know what happened. You're outright rejecting God, but with my mouth, I ain't telling you how I got saved. I didn't put a cookie in my mouth. I didn't go under the water. I'm Jesus. I'm Jesus saved. I am Jesus righteousness and not of works. So that's salvation. Salvation comes from the heart. That's that evil, wicked thing. That adultery, fornication, lying, theft, pride, on and on and on. That's the new birth. Yet, after salvation, it's still there. Sin is still there to the rapture or death. We're always going to be sinning. First John 1 9. If, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So prayer. What about prayer? Romans 10 1. Prayer is a heart essential. And one. We've gone from light. And we're looking at the light that shines in the heart. What happens when that light comes in your heart and you're now saved? Prayer. Brethren. Those are saved people falls right into it. Us. Us. My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Okay, prayer comes from the heart. It's a desire. And Paul's right here, one prayer is particularly important for us Christians. We are told in the Bible to pray for the Jews. I have finally found somebody who's witnessing the gospel to Israelites, Jews, in Israel. And when I put the money in there, I put in the box, this is for the gospel of reaching lost Jews, and this is for the Bible to help grown Jews, minus programs, and none of the junk. I'll put that there. Because my money ain't going to that. Because God's people are the Jews. I pray the Jews will be saved. I love to hear about people saying, I'm witnessing to this Jew. I add their name to my prayer list and pray that they may be saved. Paul said that's his heart's desire. And the desire in the heart is the heart is to pray. And if truly from your heart that is now righteous by salvation, verses 9 and 10, we're going to put away as we grow those childish prayers. Me, 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 want, I want, I want, I want. We're going to start reaching out to others. My prayer book is not only names in a book that's grown with the flea market ministry that we have. I am praying for them. I am seeking out for them. It's not just mumble-jumble, my Father of art in heaven, hallowed be. It ain't that. That's not art. That's reading. Yeah, I know. And people don't even realize that Matthew and Luke both had that Lord's Prayer, which is not the Lord's Prayer, but it's different. <laughs> so I'll ask the Catholic, which one do you pray? Do you pray the Matthew version or do you pray the Luke version? And they look at you, huh? You don't even study the Bible. But your heart. There are people, when God lays on my heart someone from the past, and I'll be like, I better be praying for them. There's a reason out of the blue that I remember that person's name. And that's God working on your heart. Pray for somebody else. And at that moment, when God has laid on your heart a name, a person, somebody, 
pray. Now there are people in my prayer book, I don't know if they're still alive. I pray for them, say, Lord, I don't know. If they're dead, well, Lord, I'm not praying for the dead. I just don't know. I'm ignorant to what their condition is. And the Lord understands that. We don't pray to the dead. We don't pray for the dead. But you may have somebody in your prayer list that you don't know. But that's from the heart. And when the day you find out somehow or other that, then you stop praying. Cross off their name. But when you start growing and maturing Christ after salvation in your heart, your heart kicks in now. I want to reach out to God. I want to talk to God about people. For good, should I say. 2 Corinthians 2.4 2 Corinthians 2.4 Prayer is our only communications we have with God. It's the first cell phone. And yet nobody carries it. Nobody uses it. And you don't need to charge it. People walk around with the phones in their hands, but they won't walk around talking to God. I'll be driving down the street singing praises to God and praying to God about somebody. That's not going to make me swerve off the road. That's not going to distract my driving. Well, you'll see people there that, you know, in the middle of the night, you see that blue screen coming from their, uh, their, their steering wheel, and they're bouncing from line to line. My cell phone to God doesn't have that reaction, which means you can pray with your eyes open. You can pray and not be kneeling. There's no particular stance for prayer. You can do it standing, sitting, lying down. Throughout the Bible, there's all kinds of posture of prayer. 2 Corinthians 2.4 For out of much affliction, <laughs> all they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. What does television evangelists have, have to do with this verse? Affliction and anguish. It'll you know, get you mad that somebody won't get saved. Get you mad that people won't listen. Out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote unto you with many tears. Not that ye should be grieved, but that ye might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. Paul wrote 1 Corinthians with anguish, with affliction, with tears, with prayer. You're doing it wrong. You are carnal. You are wicked. I am praying that when that letter gets to you, the epistle, it will change which it does. 2 Corinthians. They did get right. But we got to have that anguish of heart. We got to realize, you know, let's not give them excuses. Let's say, oh Lord God, I can't believe they're doing that. Lord, I pray for them. I have one particular man right now I dealt with with the Bible. Don't he thinks he's missed for, oh Lord God, he wants to be right with you, but he don't want to listen to you. Lord God, help that man. The other man, Lord God, that guy is an idiot. He's, oh, he's my brother and Lord. I pray for him. Lord, that, that family, I, I, that, these people, that church, the anguish. I pray for him. Lord, you know what the troubles are. You know what the problems are. You know we ought to be striving to seek it and please in you. And Lord, remember, I am just as wicked as they are. I am just as poor as you are. I don't need to get three seconds in the prayer life for you to start showing me I'm impatient. <laughs> okay, so I'm not, this is the beam, this is in my eye, this is the moat, and I, no. I know I'm just as bad, but Lord, I want to see them grow. I want them to do right. That comes from the heart when you look at somebody. When you look at your husband, he's not living right. Lord God, your heart breaks. Yeah. My dad, I, I, I don't know, since 1987, has never trusted Christ as a Savior yet. My heart breaks. I, I wake up at night and he's in hell. He's not. I'm saying, but that's where he's going. Lord, help him. Lord, I have exhausted every prayer I know. Lord, my wife, she's in much pain. There is absolutely nothing I can do. And then, uh, Tracy, you got to get up. Come on, Tracy, get up. Your sugar's low. Thank you, Lord, for helping me with that. That's prayer. 
And right now we live in a day and age when you look at Christians who are doing stupid things that the church promotes. We're dealing with children right now. And Lord God, please let them not be hampered. Lord, please. That comes from the heart. That has now shown that you have grown in Christ. You have a desire that, Lord, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. Lord, help them, help them, help them. If I can be, if I can be that help. We strive when we pack everything up and we hit on, I don't know the name, of it, is it Ridgewood or something like that? We talk about the glorious times that the Lord has done with us that day at the flea market. And we pray all week, Lord God, we may help the saved and the lost. Somehow, some way. Amen. You gave us that ministry. That's the Lord. That, that's He's in the heart. Jesus forever talking to the disciples. Stop thinking about yourself, guys. Others. You know why they never got the fact when Jesus said, listen, I'm going to Jerusalem, they're going to kill me, they're going to crucify me, they're going to beat me, they're... and they... I'm going to resurrect on the third day. You know why they were not at that tomb the third day waiting for Jesus? Well, see, they're going to take me, the chief priest they're going to turn me over to Pilate. Uh, what are you guys talking about? Well, who's going to be the greatest? Well, you know, they're going to crucify me. Lord, can I sit next to you and right here? That's still to me, myself, I, religion. You've got to grow out of that. A baby, newborn, in Christ, a baby worries about my diaper, feels bad, and, and i got nothing in my mouth. Ah, ah. That's a baby. That's what a baby's supposed to do. But when you get two or three years old, and mama's sitting on the couch, and the kid's got two cookies, he goes with mama, would you like to have my cookies? You look like you need a cookie. That's someone who's grown. That's right. The biggest, you know the biggest problem we're having right now? I, I know, these homeless people. Right. I don't know if they have a need. I don't know if they have a real need. And that hurts when I have to say no to them because there's plenty of nine out of ten are phony. Yeah. Some of them we've seen the same face for the whole seven years we've been down here. At the yeah. same spot. Come on, you couldn't have gotten out of this predicament in seven years? So I got one guy came to me, oh, it cost ten dollars. Yeah, but they can stand in front of Walmart. Stand in front of Walmart for eight hours, but they can't do a job. So able-bodied looking people. And that hurts because I want to help yeah. true people. And they said we stopped one time and said, "Why don't you just get a job?" And they said, "Because I make more here yeah. than at a job." They said, yep. First Corinthians two nine. And we have, we have helped homeless. Not only we we supply some of their needs, but we've given them gospel tracts. We've given them Bibles. First Corinthians 2 9. This is all the heart, and the heart needs to grow. Amen. The more you grow in the Lord with your heart, the more that other junk goes out. Now, some of that junk is sin is going to retain because we're still sinners. But there are things I am not doing that I did back in 85, 86, 87, 88. There's things I don't do them no more. There's two things I do. My heart has been cleaned by the Word. And then my heart fights the Word because I'm a sinner. And a guy, you know, like I said, a guy come up to you, oh, I've never sinned. You're a fool. That's wrong. All that sin comes short of the Lord. Let me go talk to your, your spouse, man or woman. I'll help talk to your children. You lose your temper. That's a sin. The Bible says, oh, what does it say? It says, be angry, but sin not. You can be angry. It's okay. be but when you cross that line, oh, then okay. I was angry at that employer. But I didn't cross the line. I didn't, you know, those thoughts that I, that I had in my bed, mm -hmm. that those were sin. Oh. I won't tell you. But just being angry, it's not a sin. Jesus got angry, but he never sinned. So 1 Corinthians 2 9. If you ever want to see something like this, you go into these, these craft stores, art stores. But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love Him. That's faith. And you can find all kinds of faith written on anything for a buck ninety-nine and above with shipping and handling. There are things that God has prepared for me that I don't even know what they are. There are some things that He's told me what He's prepared for me. I have an idea what they are. I know the Bible says I'm getting a brand new body. That comes from the heart. I know that. 
What's that new body consist of? Will it have a belly button? I don't know. Adam didn't have one. Eve didn't have one. Yeah, right here. There will be no pain in New Jerusalem. Well, my question is, how's that going to feel when you got no more feeling? <laughs> Is Tracy ever gonna in New Jerusalem be walking down and say, you know, I remember that back pain I had. Oh, thank God I ain't got it no more. Or is she gonna be like, what's pain? But then again, we're gonna see the nail prints in Jesus' hands and his feet and his side and the, the thorns on his head. We've got to remember something about pain, Isaiah 53, because we would not be able to read Isaiah 53 and say, well, what's suffering? Faith cometh from your saved heart. You grow. Jesus Christ died on the cross and God raised Him from the dead, Romans 10. Yeah. Oh, I believe that. Really? Okay, you're saved. Jesus Christ is coming back. He is? Right here, look. Oh, wow! One day you're going to die. That's all I was saying. Yeah, but you're still going to die. The wages of sin is death. That's written to Christians. Yeah. Oh. And they, the Bible says over here, absent from the body and present with the Lord. And... Wow. That's great. Now what? What else do I learn? Going to all the world and preach the gospel. Why? Because there are people going to hell just like you were one day. Okay, let's go. And it grows the heart of faith. Right. If I tell people about Jesus, the Bible says, oh, many are not going to believe. That's horrible. But few. God, please, let me get to the few that will get saved. Not everybody's going to get saved. That's faith. When they say you're, everybody's going to get saved, that's a lie. So you go out there. Where's your group of people? The Bible says many are not going to get saved. Oh, I just love that you're out here. Thank you very much. There's a few. That's what the Bible said. Amen. Oh, people are calling me names, making fun of me. I'll just read the Gospels. To, wow, that's what they did to Jesus. I believe that because it's happening to me. And there's so many. God made a man and a woman, even though America doesn't know that there's a there's a between a man and a woman. But the Bible says God made a male and a female, and Jesus said they made a male and a female. I believe there's a male and a female. Take off your clothes, look for in front of a full length mirror. You can see what sex you are. Guaranteed. You're just too stupid with your eyes closed. God put a man and seven of his family and two of every animal, some of them, and put them in a boat, an ark, with no engine, no sail, and prevented them from dying in a flood. I believe that. I don't need to go to Tennessee and see that stupid boat. Nowhere does the Bible say, go ye and build an ark. It says, go ye all the world and preach the gospel. Amen. Whether I go to Tennessee or I don't go to Tennessee, whether I go to Washington, D.C. for the Bible Museum in Washington, D.C., I don't need that. I take it by faith in my heart. And God, through faith in your heart, He will give you illustrations in your life. He'll give you life circumstances. He'll give you life situations that the Word will be real. How do you know it's real? Because I live it. I don't know it so. Well, the Bible says you can't know because you have not the Spirit of God because you will not believe on God. You can't understand how well I feel. There are nine fruits of the Spirit. I believe them. Why? Because I have been through problems in my life and I've had those nine fruits of the Spirit and I have people look at me saying, your life is in a crisis. I'm going home and laying on the bed that night. Lord, is it? <laughs> I mean, I know it, 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 it doesn't look good right now, but is it really that bad that Christians are telling me that's faith that comes from the heart that comes from the growth of a Christian? It's wonderful. It's great. 2 Corinthians 3.15. 2 Corinthians 3.15. This is all about the heart. You know when God saved your soul? He did a partial heart operation. And still left that sinner's heart in there. But as you grow in the Word, as you study in the Word, now you're not going to be perfected. 
Forget that. You're not going to be 100%. But as you study and grow in the Word and take part in a good church and a good Bible study, you are nourishing, you are feeding on the bread, you are finishing on the honey, the milk of the Word. That heart is getting strengthened. That heart is going. Boom. Boom. They keep telling me I, I've had two chances in my lifetime where I thought it was a heart attack. And each and every time they told me your heart is as a horse. It's ready to go. I don't feel like it. And in times you're walking, you're going to say, I don't feel right. I don't feel good. I don't this. And God's saying, relax. It's just life. Life is not good. But boy, are you good. Well done. You're doing more than what any other Christian would be doing right now. That's God speaking. That's not me. So 2 Corinthians 3.15. But even unto this day, when Moses is read to the Jewish people, mm -hmm. the law, the veil is upon their heart. So, there are circumstances as you're going to grow in the Lord, you're going to reach out to people. And you're going to look at them, you're going to say, why can't you get this? But I have. I get it all the time. When I'm preaching at the farmer's market, man, my heart just breaks for them. Because I know what they're rejecting. And you got to realize, they got a veil over their face. And I've heard people go out in the public ministry, oh, that person over there, they're an idiot, they hate us, blah, 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 all these people are there, they're just so bad, they're against us. No, they got a veil. And Paul says, I have planted Paul's word, God gave increase. That ground may need to be busted up. Now, do you know how that veil could be lightened? It already happened. When Jesus Christ suffered and died on that cross, that veil was rent into two. Only Christ is going to give you that light of remove that veil, not religion. And when you see Christ and you believe on Christ and that veil pulls apart, you look in there, the Bible says, you're not going to heaven. You are already seated in heavenly places. You just haven't made it yet. I am waiting outside of Jesus Christ. I want to hear what those seraphim sound like. Holy, holy Lord. Revelation 4. But I forget. I'm already there. I just don't hear it. I'm already in the presence of God. And when we talk about the prayer, I don't have to go take flights of stairs like the angels did with, Abel, with, with Jacob. I just say, God, i got a request. It's cool up here. All right, what's your request? Number one, I like to be up here with my body. No, forget that. What else do you want? That's what Paul wanted. When Paul went to before heaven, I believe it was Paul, he went to heaven. When he came back, that guy tried everything to get his life over. He wanted to go home. But, we've got to understand we can't get holier than now. There are people we're going to deal with. They have no idea what you're talking about. They don't know because they have not lived it. They have not had that new birth. And when you do find a new Christian, he's newly saved. Take him by the hand. Put him in the high chair. Give him the mushy food. Give him the milk. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. And please help that Christian grow. Don't leave him on the wayside like many churches do. Mm. I'm trying to think. It's hard sometimes. My son was two years old when I started seminary. That's the only time somebody really ever sat down with me in long activity to learn the Bible. I have a few people here and there help me, like this thing, you know, collecting the gospel tracts. I thank God for that person. But no one, the person that, got, that was there when I got saved, never stood by my side, never helped me. Said, okay, here's the wolf. And that's why a lot of Christians go to these Jehovah Witnesses, the Satan marks these people, and they go out and they get the young lambs and pull them out, and the shepherds and the people don't have anything to do with them. Oh, they're in a cult. Oh, don't have time. Don't try to win them back. And Jesus said, no. he went after that one sheep rather than 90 and 9. So, realize a newborn Christian, a Christian grown may have that veil in his eyes. Help him to grow. And don't throw big doctors at with you, Louise. I'm not throwing big doctors at you. You're not ready. You want to witness. That's what we're doing. The Gospel of John is great for beginners. There are churches that do, oh, we're going to do the book of Revelation. Three quarters of the book of Revelation has nothing to do with the church. 
We're gone in Revelation 4 and we don't come back to Revelation 19. And then they all worry about the mark. No, we're not here for the mark. So, Ephesians 4.18. Ephesians 4.18. When a child is born, and by the time he gets to adulthood, that heart, I don't know exactly, but that heart has more than doubled in size from when he was born. And yet in the womb, which is not life, a doctor can take an instrument and say, Mother, do you see that thing beeping? That's the child's heart. And every time you go to the doctor for your checkup, for your pregnancy, the doctor, the first thing they pretty much do is after they talk, they'll take that stethoscope, attach it to their head. We're listening for a heartbeat. The heartbeat says there's life. And when you got the heart of salvation, and you are growing in the Lord, that heart is a stronger. And the more your heart gets stronger, the more Satan and his devil hate you. So, Ephesians 4.18 Having the understanding darkened That's not good. Being alienated from the life of God through ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. We just read the darkness of them. The heart can be darkened. And yes, Christians Christians can get to the point, Lord, I'm going to believe this over the Word. I'm going to put the King James Bible down for an easy reading Bible. And I've seen them go dark. I've seen them when they come out of their modern Bible and get in the King James Bible. I've seen the light like, wow, thank you. And I've seen Christians where, you know what? I want the toys. I want the laughter. I want the good times. I don't want the persecution. I don't want to yell at. And then, now they say you cannot use this word. I'm going to use it. Retard. Now, a child that is born without necessary body functions ain't able to do, that is a birth defect. That is none of their doing. But when you got a Christian, who will not do what the Bible tells them to do, you are retarded, you are stunned of growth, you're not going nowhere. Whatever age you stop. We're never told to stop living a Christian life. And if you do, your heart will become darkened and you will go the other way. You may be saved. But when you get to the judgment seat of Christ, you now got wood, hay, and stubble rather than gold, silver, and precious stone. And 2 John says, you are maybe able to lose those rewards. I would hate to go 30, 40, 50 years as a Christian and have rewards and have gold, silver, precious stones and one day say, that's not worth it all. That'd be, that's tragic. And God will give you the power to go on. Now, 2 Corinthians 8.16. 2 Corinthians 8.16. Now what we're going to do is we're going to turn to the radio dial. We're going to turn to country music. We're going to turn to what's playing on the radio, FM, AM. We're going to look at love. The Bible says that God is love. Right. Now let me ask you a question. If God is love, and you don't know love, I mean, you don't know God, do you know love? No. There is no love outside the absence of God. If you don't know God, you don't know love. You think you know love. Come on, all this stuff on the radio. I love you. No, you don't. You're just singing to make money. You're a whore. So, love. You didn't think love was part of it. Second Corinthians, I'm the first. Big difference. Amazing when you're in a wrong book, but you look at that verse like, whoa. Second Corinthians 8, 16. But thanks. Thanks. 
Yeah. Wow, that's something big that people don't do today. Thanks be to God which put the same earnest care into the heart of Titus for you. And that's the man who named the book of Titus. Have you ever thanked God for someone else that's serving the Lord and doing right? Lord God, thank you for that man. You know, Elijah said, Lord, I'm the only one. And God's like, no, i got 500 other people. Don't worry, i got other people. And we need to thank others. We need to thank somebody come up and say, listen, I'm grabbing this stuff. I'm, going, I'm, I'm passing out gospel tracts. Or I go, we meet every year at the race. Daytona 500. We meet other churches. There are people who leave other states to come to Daytona 500 so they can witness to the crowds of people will be to the churches in Daytona Beach that don't do that. And be like, thank you very much for being here. And there are people who come down to Daytona Beach, they're vacationing, and they see our table, they see us preaching, they come up, wow, thank you, our church does that. We didn't realize there were other people. We ought to be thanking other people for their service. And they are, they'll be thanking us for their service to God. That's the love of God. And then on the other hand, people don't have the love of God. It's not what Jesus went to. Judge not that you be judged. <laughs> I always say, well, show me in the Bible where that is and we'll talk about it. Because that's not the only verse. 2 Corinthians 9-7. The world has no idea what lust is. Because their lust is love. When somebody loves someone in the world without God, they somehow, some way, want to get something from you. It's plain and simple. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. What is God going to get from us? Well, we're going to worship Him. How many angels are there going to worship Him? He's got four creatures that are weird that stand before His throne day and night. Holy, 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 Lord God. He don't need me. I am worthy of hell. Because I rejected Him. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Every man according to his purpose is hard, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loveth a cheerful giver. And you preach that in your radio, television, your ministry, your glass church ministry. He's preaching about money again. Give, 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 give. That's all they want. <laughs> God says, I don't want that. If you're going to give that dollar and you're going to give it grudgingly, keep it in your pocket and go get yourself a cup of coffee. Right. I don't want it. That's what he said. Now, if you love me, if you love me, you're going to give it. I give to the Lord because I love Him. And there are things happening that, Lord, i got to do it this way. The Lord says, hey, you're doing it because you love me. I understand. I can't get into the details of that. Ephesians 5.19. Great. Nice breezy. People say, it's too hot to be where you guys are. No, we got to control our Bible to be flying across the room. Ephesians 5.19 We have a love that the world doesn't have. Our love from the love of God is charity. Charity is a love of sacrifice. And Paul speaks about it in 1 Corinthians 7. He says, you want to get married? Okay. But you may have to give up that missionary money because your wife, your wife may need a restaurant tonight. But Lord, I want to support missionaries. Your wife is tired. She's been in the kitchen all, the, all this time. You need to take that money and put it down. Or to the wife, you know, when you want a husband, that's perfectly fine. You may have to take that sewing money. You may have to take that whatever money you have. You, you may have to go buy him something. Well, he don't need it. Yes, he does. In the Bible, it's recorded as far as the husband and wife that your money that may go to the church may be for the other because they need something. Mm -hmm. 
and you love me, you'll take care of your spouse. See, and just shortly, we're not under tithes in the church age. And that right now, we just a whole bunch of people hit the floor, call 911. We are under what we just read, love offering, what you want to give to God. You may have bills. And you got to pay your bills, the Bible says. But if you give what you give, you give 10%, great. Amen. Right. Glory to God. Give it cheerfully. Ephesians 5, 19. He shows where I am. Speaking to yourselves. <laughs> That's talking to yourself. It's a Bible doctrine, talking to yourself. Rachel. Speaking to yourselves in Psalms. That's reading the book of Psalms. And Psalms is your hymn book. I'm doing a series right now on the hymns. Many of your hymns are not biblical. They're wrong. The one, the biblical hymns in the Bible are the ones in the book of Psalms. 150 of them. Speaking to yourselves. In Psalms and hymns. Okay, there are some hymns that are good. Spiritual songs. You know the best song you can sing to the Lord is one out of your heart that no one wrote down. I will take a tune of a hymn and I will add my own words going down the road or I can't sleep or just sing it to the Lord out of my own words. Out of your own heart. God loves that. If God doesn't want you to say, follow, uh, I can't say that. I can't say the Lord's Prayer. Uh, our Father who art in heaven. If God does not want me to say that, what makes him think that he wants you to read off a song page? And a lot of the hymns are written by the hymnist as a poem to God for their praising God. It may not be your life. So you go down the road and may, oh, I got the joy, joy, joy down deep in my heart. I got $10 now. I got, thank you, Lord. I got the joy. We had a great Bible, Lord God. Thank you. Oh, Roberto read the, with me with the Bible last night. Oh, I got the joy. joy. Those, those are from your heart. And God likes that. Remember that other verse we just read? Giving thanks. Giving thanks to God. Uh, spiritual song, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Giving thanks. There's that thanks again. That's what we're lacking today. Thanks. There are times, Lord God, oh, oh Lord, whatever it is. A month down the road. Lord God, did I ever thank you for answering that prayer? I don't remember. Lord, did I ever thank you? You know what Paul says to the Thessalonian church? Even in pain and troubles and sorrows, always giving thanks. That one's hard. Amen. That one's hard. 1 Timothy 1.5. Oh, I like this one too. What's that? In Ephesians um, 3, 17. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, faith, that ye may be rooted and grounded in love. Yeah, there you go. Amen. You know what rooted is? Jesus said, Him that heareth my words is like a man that built his house upon the rock. The winds and the waves and the storms came. Nothing touched that house. That's what that is. Rooted. In your heart you can be rooted in God with all the trials, troubles, tribulations, and other people. God is still yours. Never leave me with the me. That's strong. First Timothy one five. We'll add that one. Ephesians three three seventeen. First Timothy one five. Feels good. Feels like a pain. First Timothy one five. This is all your heart for God. Now the end of the commandment is charity. That's love giving in action. John 3.16 is charity. He gave. A man to get a woman in a hotel room in the backseat of the car. That is, he lusted. Now, the end of the commandment is charity out of pure heart. What's the only way a man can get a pure heart? From God. And of good conscience. All right, there's the mind. 
But the conscience is of the heart. I did something wrong. I gotta get right. I'm thinking about doing something wrong. I don't want to do it. And faith, unfeigned, unpretend, no performance. So look what we have here. We got a pure heart, a good conscience. Unfeigned faith comes from that heart. Comes from God and God alone. It is. Well, we're going to end right there anyway. We're going to pick up again next week. So, go ahead. Sure. Okay. What do we got for next week? Done. Yeah. All right. That's over there. Is. That's done over there.